Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Brad Feld. Brad, how are we doing? I'm good, Gabriel. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. So you are the managing director of the Founder Group. Now, we're going to get into that in a little bit. But first, I would love to the world to go ahead and get a little background. Brad, where you're calling from, give us a little background uh, introduction. Who is Brad? Uh, I'm calling you from Boulder, Colorado. My wife, Amy Bachelor, and I have lived here for uh, 27 years. Uh, so this is very solidly home. Uh, I've been started started off as an entrepreneur, sold that company to a public company in the mid 90s, made a bunch of angel investments, started a couple more companies, all tech related, um, became a venture capitalist, uh, started investing as a VC in 1996. Um, had a wild ride up during the internet bubble and a wild ride down after it crashed <laughs> uh, and have uh, have continued to be an investor since then. Uh, I started Foundry with uh, uh, three partners in 2007, and I'm also co-founder of Techstars, which I started with three other guys in 2006. Nice. So what was that first uh, business that you had, that first entrepreneurial endeavor? First business was an excruciatingly named company called Feld Technologies. Excruciating because I learned over time that when somebody's unhappy with you, they don't, they don't they call for Mr. Feld. My partner's last name was Jilk, and they never called for Mr. <laughs> when they're pissed off at us. Uh, something we screwed up. But that was a software consulting business that uh, was bootstrapped, self-funded. Uh, we started it in 1987. Uh, I was a senior in college, <clears throat> and we sold it to a public company in 1993. And I had never invested in a company. I'd never bought or sold anything. So it was a really transformative experience to end up, you know, having having built this, you know, modest size. We were a 20-something person, a couple million dollar year company, uh, but that we built from scratch to all of a sudden now being part of the executive team of this very rapidly growing public company. How did you scale a company, you know, in school to become a 20-employee company, million dollar revenue generating Day by day, week by week, month by month. So um, my partner, Dave, and I, for the first year and a half or so, it was just us. So we, <clears throat> you know, we made some really bad mistakes early on. We hired a half dozen or so people part time. Um, you know, we had some illusion that we were going to be able to generate enough business for everybody. And of course, all we did was lose a bunch of money the first couple of months. <laughs> We had, we had no money. So like, I didn't know, you know, like, what could we do? We, 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 we didn't have money to lose. So we fired everybody. And I think, you know, started every month, you know, we make 3000 bucks revenue and, you know, pay ourselves a tiny bit. And then, you know, next month we make a little bit more and eventually we're making 10 or $15,000 a month top line. And <clears throat> at some point we hired a, you know, a first, our first employee, a guy named Sean who joined us and we just systematically built the company. We, we had to make money though every month because we never raised any outside capital. We only raised $10 uh, from Dave, myself, and my father, who was an advisor to us, we had 10 shares of stock and each was worth a dollar. And we sold the company. We still only had 10 shares of stock. Fortunately, they were worth more than a dollar yeah. uh, each, but you know, we just, we just had to build a business, yeah. uh, by, you know, having a product that we sold to customers and made more money each month than we spent. You know, let's, let's talk about the shares for a little bit. You mentioned you had 10 shares. How does your, like, how does a company define or determine how many shares are going to issue? Completely and totally arbitrary. We could have issued 10 shares uh, for a dollar each. Uh, we could have issued 10 million shares uh, for a thousandth of a penny each or a hundred thousandth of a penny each. It's just arbitrary. And um, there is a nuance, a, a tax nuance, if you incorporate in Delaware or some states that you incorporate where you have to pay what's called a franchise tax. And in some cases, the more shares you have, the more your franchise tax is. So oh, interesting. Interesting. To having less shares, but that's sort of technical legal issue that happens depending on where you incorporate the company. Um, but it's arbitrary. And, yeah. you know, the, the interesting thing about a company is uh, as a founder, you think about it as how much, what percentage of the company do you own? Right. So in that first company, I, I, I had six shares, so I own 60% of it. Dave had 30%. My dad had 10%. Um, and an important thing to realize is you can only have hundred percent. So if right. you sell equity to somebody, regardless of the amount of shares they have, the total percent ownership of the company still has to add up to a hundred percent. Yep. Very true. Now let's, let's talk about, you know, first let's talk about the foundry group. What is it? And then how did you create it? Sure. So foundry is a venture capital firm. Um, we invest in 
uh, mostly early stage tech companies, although 25% of our capital is invested in other early stage venture funds. So uh, what are essentially pre-seed and seed stage investors, we're typically investing in the series A or sort of after a company has raised some money from a seed investor. Uh, we also occasionally do a later stage uh, investment. Um, we have six partners today. Uh, we're all equal partners. Uh, we have about four billion, a little bit over four billion dollars uh, across all the different funds that we've raised going back 2007. Um, we invest all across the U.S., so we don't really invest internationally. I, I did some of that in the late 1990s and early 2000s, and just got my head handed to me. <laughs> um, and at some point, I realized it, you know I was both not good at it, and it was just really, really, really difficult to deal with the geography and the different uh, different countries. Um, but, you know, we have companies all over the United States that we've invested in and, you know, we, we don't own and control the companies. We tend to own 10 to 30% of them. Uh, and we try really, really hard to work closely with the founders and the leaders of the company and support them in whatever way they need versus view it as our company where we're trying to direct people. So it sounds like your target audience is already individuals that have tested their tested their product and actually begun to make it in production and start to be on, like you mentioned, beyond the seed process. So they, yeah. they've kind of tested and true. Yeah, generally not all, but most of the companies we've invested in, we invest in have a product in the market already, although it might be very small, their revenue, you know, total revenue might be hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. They don't have to be significant businesses yet. They might be, you know, 10, 15, 20 people, but they're usually beyond now the idea phase. The funds that we've invested in, we've invested in about 50 of them. Um, those funds tend to invest at the very earliest idea phase, as does Techstars, which we're a large shareholder in. So we have exposure to companies at that gotcha. stage, but we're tending to write our first direct check into the company when they've made a little bit more progress. Now, how does one start a venture capital fund? How, how did you decide to kind of go into and start Foundry and bring in the partners and actually create this fund to be able to go out and provide venture capital to others? Yeah, there's different ways to do it. Um, so I could probably talk about my, my experience because uh, it's one of the paths. I was uh, I was living in Boston after I sold that first company, which 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 we built to create it in Boston. And uh, I took most of the money that I made from selling that first company. I made a couple million bucks. Um, and I invested uh, between 1994 and 1996 in 40 companies. It's about one a month. And I was essentially the very first investor in many of those companies. Um, my checks were small. Maybe I was writing a twenty-five dollars or $50,000 check, but I was usually bringing other investors alongside me. So I was that angel investor who put together a group or a syndicate of other angel investors. And sometimes it was a couple hundred thousand dollars. Sometimes it might be a million dollars, but I was investing at that stage. And for, I don't know, a handful of those companies, I helped start them. I was a co-founder and maybe I was chair of the company, but I didn't run any of them. I wasn't CEO. I didn't have an operating day-to-day -day operating role in any of them. Um, along the way, um, I got connected with, uh, you know, as I was making angel investments, obviously I started to get to know different uh, VC investors who are investing after that stage. I also, bizarrely, my first company had a bunch of venture capital firms as clients. We wrote a piece of software um, that uh, a firm used for managing their portfolio um, and really for reporting on their portfolio, which in okay. the late 1980s and early 1990s was mostly done like in a word processing document or a Lotus 123 spreadsheet. We wrote a piece of software that allowed you to actually enter the data and uh, and 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 print out the reports. If people are familiar with a company called Carta uh, today, which is a company that helps startups manage their cap tables and a bunch of other things, we, nice. we'd written, you know, a, a very rudimentary version of what Carta uh, Carta is. So I we knew a bunch of VCs because they were clients of ours. And um, as I was doing more and more angel investments, I ended up kind of randomly intersecting with a Japanese firm that was starting to buy companies in the U.S. and make investments in what was at the time called digital media, it became very quickly called internet companies, which is a company called SoftBank, which today is extremely well known. Yeah, But yeah. in the mid-90s in the U.S., it was nascent. It had no people in the U.S., maybe one person in the U.S. It was very not very visible as, a, as an investor. And um, Masayoshi Son, who was the founder uh, of SoftBank, had 
bought a couple of companies and then a couple of those people organized a, a team to start making venture investments. And there was a group of us, I was one of, of four people that became an affiliate. So in today's parlance in the venture landscape, it might be called a scout. And I was basically, the four of us were basically doing our own investments, um, but we could bring things to SoftBank and if SoftBank liked it, they did the investment, invested some money and we got some economics on the money that they invested. And that was me, uh, a guy named Fred Wilson, who is well known for writing a blog called ABC, but is also the, the co-founder of uh, Union Square Ventures, which has been an extraordinarily successful venture firm. A guy named Jerry uh, Colonna, who was, ended up being Fred's partner in a venture firm called Flatiron Partners. Jerry lives in Boulder, a mile from me. We're extremely close friends to this day. And then another guy named Rich Levendorf, who was also a Boston-based sort of investor, angel investor. The, the four of us didn't work for SoftBank, but we were making investments alongside this team. And in 1997, or maybe sometime in 1996, SoftBank essentially ran out of money. And so a group of us, me and three of the people that work for SoftBank, raised a fund that SoftBank sponsored and it took us about a year to raise the fund. We raised it, closed it by the end of 97. That was a $300 million venture fund of which SoftBank was 13 million of it. So we had to raise a lot of money separate from theirs, but that firm was called SoftBank Technology Ventures. So for a couple of years, we were the US investor SoftBank. And that's how I got involved in venture. It was totally random. It was not deliberate. I didn't have a, a plan of action. Um, uh, I was very happy uh, and I'm very happy that I had the experience. There's a lot of ups and downs in the experience. Um, and, you know, SoftBank, when we started investing, even before we raised that first fund and we're investing SoftBank money or money that SoftBank had raised, it was a very different kind of investing activity than the traditional venture capital investing activity in terms of pace, velocity, the number of investments we were doing. I think at our peak, we were doing about one new investment a week, which was kind of unheard of from wow. a venture perspective wow. at the time. Um, but I just, I learned a shitload of things, both good and bad. Um, and uh, that arc with SoftBank continued for a while, but then eventually in 2007, with three of the people I worked with at SoftBank, uh, we started Foundry. So it was a decision. And, and as part of that, ironically, uh, uh, I, we continued, and then ultimately, I continued to manage all of the old SoftBank funds that we'd raised, which we had renamed to now Mobius Venture Capital. So we, at some point, changed the name of the thing. Um, and we're just now shutting down the very last one of those funds. So venture funds wow. can last a very, very long time, whether you want them to or not. <laughs> you know, you know, it's interesting because it sounds like you've really been leveraging your own network as well to kind of build how important has, you know, networking been to venture capital and, and you as your career? Well, enormously. Uh, but networking is a vague word. So I'll be more precise, like from in the nineties uh, and even the early two thousands, I was all over the place all the time. I mean, I traveled 75% of the time. Um, you know, three out of four weeks, I was in the Bay Area. Um, I was co-chair of a company that went public that was New York based. So I would take a red eye across the country to New York. Ouch. Um, you know, I was, I was very involved in lots of different companies. And so the network and the network activity built. And then of course, the network that we had as a result of all of the soft bank linkages was quite powerful. And the network that came from the guys that bought my first company and the work that I got to do with them and all the people in that, uh, that, that uh, landscape was very powerful. I continued to do that. And of course, I, you know, if anybody out there is familiar with Techstars, Techstars is, you know, a very, very large global network for entrepreneurs at this point. Yep. We've funded over 3000 companies since we started it 14 years ago. Um, you know, it's in, uh, I don't know, 13, 14 countries. We've got programs. We run about 50 new accelerator programs a year at this point. So it's an enormous network. Um, but one of the things that was different in, in the networking activity that I did was I started writing very actively around 2004, 2005. I started a blog at uh, feld.com and I blogged pretty much every day for about um, almost 15 years. And uh, there were a few other people who blogged like that. Fred Wilson, who I'd mentioned earlier, started blogging a little bit earlier than I did, maybe three, three to six months earlier, but sort of the same type of pacing, just lots and lots and lots of blogs. 
lots of content around entrepreneurship and investment well before blogs were popular, well before people were posting contents, well before Twitter existed and people could you know, pretend to drop pearls of wisdom in 140 characters, which <laughs> I don't think can actually be done. I think most you can do with 140 characters is snark. Um, <laughs> and uh, what, what ended up happening was I built a very broad virtual network. And that virtual network were people who were either connected to me through the physical interaction that we had or the virtual interaction that we had, but I maintained it virtually. And if I wind the clock forward to today, um, I, I stopped traveling for a variety of reasons around 2013, 2014. Uh, and then I started traveling again and traveled less, but regularly until COVID. And when COVID happened, I stopped traveling like everybody else did. And I just decided I was done. I'm ne I was never going to travel again for business. So I don't travel for business anymore. I just do everything virtually. I do everything by nice. video. Uh, if people want to see me in person for some reason, like, I, I don't know why they want to, because I smell fun. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I'm happy to spend time with people, you know, one-on-one -on -one if they're, if they're wherever I am physically, but that network and, and the network management wasn't a deliberate thing. I didn't have a CRM system that I was keeping track of people and making sure I reached out to people. It was just making myself available, being responsive, engaging with lots of different people, being open to lots of different stuff, uh, you know, doing things like this where, you know, I don't, I have a, a phrase that's become the Techstars mantra, which is called give first. Uh, it came from a phrase I had in a book from 2012 called startup communities. And the phrase was give before you get. And the idea is that uh, my philosophy is you should be willing to put energy into the, into a system without knowing what you're going to get back. It's not altruism. You expect to get something back. You just don't know when, from whom, over what time frame, and what, form, what consideration, what magnitude. So if you're willing to put energy into the system and just do that continually without having to predefine the relationship, uh, really wonderful things come back. And my own experience in, in business and in life, I'm, I'm in my uh, 56, almost 57 years old, is that it's, it's really a very satisfying and powerful way to exist. Yeah. You know, and I, I kind of envision this podcast as similarly, right? Where just kind of continue to create content, continue to create blog posts, doing almost 100 episodes now or getting close to 100 episodes. Unsure what the end goal is and what's going to come out of it, but I know something good is going to come out of it. And I'm already kind of creating foundations, building report. I'm, I'm able to have a conversation with you, right? And so it's slowly kind of growing organically by itself as well. You totally get it. I mean, that's exactly what I was describing. Now, you you also kind of mentioned, you know, about the board of directors and you've been sitting on a couple of board of directors now, talk about talk about how does one scale a board of directors? How does one build a board of directors? You know, those I feel like board of director positions are extremely important because they're going to help you know drive the, the the company. But how do you kind of build that up? So I've been on many boards. Um, I don't I don't know the number anymore, but you know more more than a hundred, probably less than a thousand, um, uh, but somewhere in between those, and probably closer to a thousand than a hundred and. I've been on some extraordinary boards. I've been on a bunch of mediocre boards and I've been on some really bad boards. And, you know, like, like most uh, institutional things, you know, they they range and there's a whole bunch of things that are average and there's some that are really extraordinary and some that are really awful. Um, the topic of boards was interesting uh, to me. I, I again, wrote a book on it in 2013. I wrote a, a book called startup boards and, and I just came out with a second edition of, of it. Uh, which is also called Startup Boards. Um, and in it, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how to make the board effective for an entrepreneur. And, you know, what are the things around a board that are important? And I come back to over and over again, and these are not for public company boards, but again, for boards of startups or companies that are fast growing companies, to a very simple philosophy that I've had for a long time as a starting point, which is uh, as long as I support the CEO, I work for her as a board member. Now I got government re governance responsibilities and I've got some formal legal responsibilities, right, but right. philosophically, as long as I support the CEO, I work for her. If I don't support her, or I find at one point that I'm not no longer supporting her, it's my job to do something about it, which doesn't mean fire her. It means work to try to get back to the place where I support her. And as a, as a board member, as an investor, and as a board, there's usually one tool available to, uh, to, you know, to that, 
to the board as a whole, which is to, to replace the CEO or fire the CEO, not 100% of the time. There are definitely some situations where the CEO, you know, controls is a larger shareholder and controls the company. But in, in most venture back companies, that's, uh, that's something the board, the board can do. But it, that philosophy of, uh, of working for the CEO, knowing that every CEO needs different things. And then to your specific question of scaling up a board, when the CEO views the board as another team she gets to use, it's powerful. So, you know, every CEO gets to have a management team and you build your management team and you, you know, one of your important roles as a CEO is to develop the management team and keep people in alignment and do all the work around that. Why not do the same thing with your board? Like view your board as another team. And yeah, that board can fire you, but that's sort of a secondary consequence of things not working. Uh, if you're actively engaged with the board and you know you're helping that board be an effective team, the chance of them firing you is pretty low. Right. Um, because if they're involved with what's going on, if things are not going well, they're involved in it too. And you're probably not going to be the one to blame. I mean, you could be, but uh, I, I think that's the most important thing. View the board as a team. And then structurally, um, I think that way too many startup boards are either uh, VC dominated or there's just not much intent put into deciding who should be on the board and then doing this work of building a team. So I like boards that are balanced. I like boards that for every VC, there's an independent director. Uh, and I like boards that have, you know, uh, good gender, uh, good gender diversity. So you've got both men and women on the boards. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, in the last couple of years, I, I was uh, sort of tuned into the notion of being much clearer, not just deliberate about gender diversity, but racial diversity in terms of yep. board composition. And, you know, getting people that have different frames of references, especially depending on what kind of product you're selling, right? If you're selling us, uh, you know, a B2B software product versus you're selling, uh, a piece of consumer hardware versus you're selling a consumer service versus, you know, lots of different types of businesses. Like yeah. think about what configuration of people and what skill set really helps you as the CEO uh, build and, and develop your company. You know, that's, that's a great example. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm currently the president of the board of directors for American Association of Physician Liaisons, which is a, a national physician liaison group for healthcare because I work in the healthcare world. And it's true, you know, I'm sitting here um, having, you know, this conversation with you and I'm thinking to myself, the conversation I've recently had with the board and talking about my goals for this next year, recently being appointed president and stating my goal is to actually add diversity to the board, right? I'm currently the only individual of color. Uh, I want to ensure that there's other individuals so we can kind of get their insight because cultural awareness and understanding what plagues their culture and their communities is, is important, especially in the healthcare world, Right. Now, with that said, you know, you've kind of been talking quite a bit about, um, you know, the venture capital piece and like choosing, really trying to choose in a, a company that a, a, kind of seems like to align that you seem fast growing. How do you go about choosing who you're going to fund? Well, it again, varies by venture firms. So this is a personal, uh, personal frame of reference. Um, historically, I was very focused on two things. One was the people and the other was the product. Um, and I've gone through many sort of arcs and tried different things. And at Mobius, we had a very complex way of trying to decide what we we're going to fund and rating and scoring companies. And in the end, for me, it ended up being people and product. Like, you know, are these people I want to be partners with? And is this a product that I care about? And I, I've gotten to the place where I now describe that very simply as, as having, having kind of three, uh, three pieces to it. One, um, uh, is do I have affinity for the product? And it doesn't mean that I have to be a daily user of it, but do I care about it? If I don't care about the product, it's really hard to keep your head in the game when things go off the rails. Yeah. Um, so I have to care. I have to think the product that's being created is one that matters and that's useful and that people care about. And there are plenty of products in the world that end up being very successful that I just don't care about. I'm not going to be a good investor for that company. Um, the second is that the founders and the leaders of the company need to be obsessed about what they're doing. And I, there's unhealthy connotations of the word obsession, but there's a lot of healthy connotations. And I like to focus on the healthy side of it, which is, um, if you're, uh, you know, we're, we're a question I'll ask people when they say, well, what do you mean by obsessed is were you put on planet earth to work on this problem? And you don't have to be 
working on this problem for the rest of your life. It doesn't have to be the thing that you were solely committed to doing. But at this moment in time, is this the thing that you were put on planet Earth to do? And then the last for me is, do they want to be partners with me as much as I want to be partners with them? If they don't really want to be partners with me or I'm just representing capital and there doesn't really, there's no engagement, mm -hmm. it's less interesting to me and vice versa. Um, you know, if they're super excited about me being an investor and I'm like, eh, I don't really care about them that much as people. Same thing. Like when everything's going fine, it's no big deal. It's when things go off the rails, when things get really difficult that it really matters. You know, one of the things you mentioned when you're talking about the board was, you know, your relationship with this and ensuring that the individual feel that they're part of, you know, your secondary team, right? The board is a secondary team to you. How do you actually help scale a CEO? How do you, how do you help scale yourself as being a CEO? Well, it's so two different questions. How do you scale a CEO as a board? And then how do you help a CEO scale? Um, I don't think you can scale a CEO. I think the the dynamics of helping a CEO scale or a CEO saying, I need, I need help scaling. I need to learn how to do this is much more interesting. And there's a couple of ways. One is um, having that, that CEO have lots of peer CEOs that, uh, that they can talk to, including peers that are further ahead of them, but also ones that they can learn from. So the sort of mentor-mentee dynamic uh, with peers, with other CEOs uh, is very significant. Um, I think a vast majority of CEOs in our portfolio have a dedicated CEO coach. It's not a full-time person that works for the company, but it's somebody that they meet right. with, you know, once a week, once every other week, maybe once a month, but it's a coach just like, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big runner. I have a track coach and I have a nutritionist and, you know, they're people who uh, not only pay attention to what's going on with me, but help me learn and help me improve, especially right. when I get into a new zone in terms of my, my fitness or exercise. Um, and then I think the last is, uh, and it's something that's become, I think, part of the wiring in the last few years in a, in a healthy way is sort of this notion of uh, a CEO being uh, introspective about their their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, there are lots of different words like vulnerable and authentic get tossed around. But, but fundamentally, it's recognizing that, you know, we're all good at some stuff and we're all shitty at other stuff. And, you know, when the thing that you're not good at is something that you need to be good at. Yeah. It, it, most of those things are learned skills, not all of them, you know, I'll never be a professional NBA player. So there's definitely limitations that we all have. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, if, even if you're not going to be a professional NBA player, you can become a pretty good free throw shooter just by practicing. Yeah, very good. By very focusing good on your form and by doing it a lot. And I, so it's sort of just being aware that even though I'm not good at this thing necessarily, I could be, and I need to learn, I need to practice. And what do I need to do to learn and practice and making that part of what you're doing? You know, in the venture capital world, you're you're giving away a lot of funds, right? You're helping startups. How do you define success? What is what is success for you for a venture capitalist? It's super easy, right? Our we have investors who we call limited partners or LPs. They give us a box of money, and our job is to return a box full of more money to them. <laughs> uh, that's it. And as long as we do it legally, then we are successful. If we give them back at the end, you know, at the end of the life of the fund, if we give them back a box with less money in it, we're we failed. <laughs> Yeah. If we give them back a box with the same amount of money in it, we failed because there's a cost of capital. Yep. If we give them back a box with a tiny bit more money in it, and we failed, right? You know, we need to give them back a bigger, a box full of more money that is commensurate with sort of the risk return expectations they have, which in the world of venture, you know, people throw around numbers like IRR and multiple of cash. It's it's kind of baseline expectation is is that if you give me a dollar, when my fund finishes, which is usually, you know, 10, 15 years later, I've given you back at least three times the money. What's the hardest part of giving them back a box full of money? Um, uh, probably it's easy to invest in companies, although it's hard to invest in the right companies. It's very hard to help the companies be successful. So I think the hardest part of it is sort of navigating that, not just the internal issues that companies have on their path, but all the external issues. I'll just give an example of something that was totally new in my, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, totally new in my world that came up, uh, you know, this earlier this year. And something, if you'd said, this is going to happen two years ago to me, I would have just laughed out loud at you. <laughs> uh, we have a portfolio company that has uh, a US-based company, but they have a team in Russia, in Moscow, and they have a team in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, if you uh, if you had said to me there's going to be a land war between Russia and Ukraine, uh, I would have laughed at you. All right, so that happened. And you're like, okay, so I've got 
teams of people that are working on product where some of the people are in Moscow and some of the people are in Kiev and they're on the same team. Yeah. Uh, how do you navigate that? And oh, by the way, there's all these exogenous factors, you know, uh, uh, you know, value of money, ability of money, ability of movement. We have one of the, you know, uh, one of the Ukrainian employees can't relocate because he's military age. So he's not allowed to leave the country. You know, like just all these things. You're like, whoa, what? How, what? Where did this come from? Yeah. Um, I wrote a blog post a while ago. Uh, and the title of the blog post tells the whole post, which is something new, uh, keyword new in my world is fucked up every day. So every day I run into something new that's fucked up. And if by the end of the day, I haven't encountered it yet, I'm kind of curious what it is. <laughs> I'm every day. I'm every day. And it's something new. It's not the same thing day after day. It's something Ooh. new. And every now and then it's something completely new. I was sitting uh, and, and working one afternoon around Christmas time is maybe a week or two before Christmas. And the CEO of, of one of our companies that uh, had had at the time a consumer toy product that had huge amounts of business during the month of December called me up and in, in a panic, he says, I'm outside my building. Our building just broke. Uh, you know, up oh, fire engines come and call you back. I'm like, huh, what? <laughs> and, you know, fortunately they got everybody out of the building, but it's two story building this. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, pieces of steel that held the second floor up uh, had a, had what I guess it's like a stress fracture or something had bent and the concrete floor underneath it or above it shattered wow. and the whole floor sunk. Jesus. And fortunately there was nobody on the first floor in the building. So nobody got hurt on the first floor and all the people on the second floor were now on a broken floor and they had to get out of the building. And then the fire department condemned the building. And said you can't go back in the building. So people wow. have car keys in the building. They have their wallets on their desks. They have all their computer shit on. Oh wow! Uh, you know, and eventually people were able to get their car keys and their wallets. But you know, it's a office, and everybody's working in their office. And this is well before you know COVID and remote work. And it's like, uh, like we got stuff to do. Sorry, <laughs> you know. Um, so you know, you have to sort of navigate these crazy things all the time. And um, I think that's. I think that's probably the hardest part of the work. Has there been anything easy? Uh, man, probably not. I mean, I, I don't think business is easy. I don't think that word really applies. I think anybody that says, oh yeah, it's easy. It comes naturally. We don't have any trouble. Everything's been great from day one. It's all worked. And they're full of shit. I mean, every successful company I've ever been involved in has had at least one near death experience. <laughs> and, um, you know, one really, really, terrifying moment that could have lasted for 30 days. It didn't have to last for one minute. Right. And some of them are just stupid self-inflicted things like, you know, the company that's doing, it's got an incredible, uh, 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 I try to think about how to say it generically, but uh, incredible online game, you know, that loses their domain. Yeah. But now all of a sudden nobody can go play their online game. Well, how, how'd you lose your domain? Well, we had it registered to go daddy for $9. And okay, so you're generating ten million dollars a month of revenue off your online game, and you're trusting your world to go daddy for nine bucks. And what happened? Well, well just no, nobody remembered that we had it, and it expired, and somebody else grabbed it. Well, duh, <laughs> right? And you know, you can you work through it, right? But it's even when things are going great, there's always stuff like that that causes just abject fear and panic that you have to work through. You know, that's a great, that actually reminds me of now the Washington, right? The, the Washington football team, uh, formerly the Washington Redskins. Yeah. And uh, they were looking for a new name. An individual over there in Miami, a lawyer in Miami decided to copyright all of the names he knew that they would probably try to use. <laughs> got them all copyrighted, got all the websites. And so now they're the commanders, you know, and, and it was, it was a lot of great names that the, he, he was able to, uh, but again, to that point, you just got to be a little bit, you know, it's, business is not easy. You got to, got to be a little smart about it. Now, speaking of which, what motivates you to continue to, what continues to motivate you to continue to go forward? I've always really enjoyed um, being helpful to other people, being involved with other smart people and learning from them. Um, you know, when I was younger, there was a lot that drove me that was ambition you know, that was uh, sort of the ego dynamics associated with success. As I've gotten older, 
uh, and and sort of had plenty of success and also had plenty of failure. That those things have sort of fallen to the wayside. So it's more just the ability to learn, the ability to teach, and the ability to engage with people that I that I find stimulating and that hopefully I'm helpful to. Nice. Now, as as a venture capitalist, what keeps you up at night? Not not much. I sleep pretty well. Man, you know, I'm I gotta take this question away every time I ask. Everybody keeps saying. Oh, they, I used to not. I, used, I I used to not sleep that well. I used to think I was sleeping well because I traveled all over the place and I fell asleep on airplanes at the time that the oh, engine yeah. came on, and I thought I would sleep till we hit the ground. And then I got very depressed in 2013 and was depressed for about six months. And um. Uh, I was very open about the depressive episode that I had, and I just stopped waking up with an alarm clock. I used to be the guy that got up at five o'clock in the morning, no matter what time zone mm -hmm. I was. In. So I just had, like, had this, again, ego attachment is probably the best phrase for it to that. And for six months, I slept more than 12 hours a night. I was just exhausted. And um, I think that really helped me understand just how critically important sleep was to health. And, you know, I go to sleep. My wife and I, we don't have kids. We're early birds. We tend to go to sleep you know, 8.30, 9 o'clock. And, you know, I wake up each morning sort of naturally at yeah. you know, 5.30 to 7. And, you know, now that I'm in my late 50s, I wake up a couple of nights to go to the bathroom. A couple oh, of times yeah. Oh, to go yeah. To the bathroom. And, I, you know, annoyed me a little while, a little bit, but I fall asleep like within a minute after crawling back in bed. So now it's kind of like, a, oh, it's 2.30. I get to sleep some more. Cool. <laughs> um, it's always around 2.30 and 5. <laughs> Every now, you know, every now and then I'll have something that really agitates me. And it's usually a very specific thing. And it's often irrational, right? So when I'm agitated, it's usually because of an irrational thing that is causing me, you know, to sort of cycle on it. And I've learned enough about my own psychology that that usually just means that I'm tired. Yeah. 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 Your body certainly does need the rest sometimes, right? And we can got to even when you're burning the candle at birth ends, it, it tends to burn pretty quickly, unfortunately. Yeah. Now, what advice would you give some of the listeners at home, either, you know, board director, board of members, CEOs, individuals that are in the tech startup? What, uh, what in, kind of advice would you give an inspiring entrepreneur? Uh, let's see. We are all going to die. And as a result of that, be deliberate about what you spend your time on and how you spend your time and know that you'll have plenty of time that you spend on stuff that doesn't work out or that isn't satisfying. That's just the overhead of being a human being, but work hard to put yourself in a position so you can spend time on the things you want to spend time on. That's a great point. And, you know, I've, I've been finding myself recently, uh, instead of consuming, you know, reels of TikTok and Facebook and things of that nature, it's trying to consume books, right? Pages, uh, just to kind of break it up a little bit. Cause I think there's, there's a lot of static out there. Uh, and, it, and there's a lot of good opportunity in books as well as networking and just meeting with other people versus just sitting at home behind your phone or computer, uh, getting out there and meeting with folks. And, and as, like you mentioned, you know, having individuals from Moscow and curve, you know, actually on the same team, uh, we're, we're in a global economy, right? And so, extending the hand out to those with different cultures and different sexual orientations is okay. Because at the end of the day, business is not easy. Uh, you know, as Brad was kind of saying and, and doing it together is a lot, it makes it a lot easier than uh, trying to do it by yourself. Well said. Well, Brad, thank you so much. Before we go, where can all the folks find you? Where can they find you online? Where can they find you on the social? I'm easy to be found. Uh, my website is feld, F -E -L -D com, And I've got 15 years or more of content there that you can bore yourself with all you want. Um, I do have a Twitter account at Befeld. Um, I, uh, I do not, uh, I, I follow zero people on Twitter. <laughs> so I, I occasionally will tweet things out whenever I write a blog post, it gets tweeted out. Sometimes I'll retweet something that I see interesting, but I, I would not consider that to be an active place anymore. And I, have essentially eliminated all the rest of the social stuff. I, I deleted my Facebook account a number of years ago. Um, I still have trouble spelling TikTok. Uh, <laughs> and every time I tried to use Snap, whatever I did disappeared right after I created it. So I never tried to figure out what was going on there. 
I love it, Brad. Thank you so much. Again, for those folks that are listening, please subscribe to the newsletter. I will have Brad's information on there as well as a link to his uh, website so you can find more information about the Foundry Group. And again, tech uh, tech founders, please be on the lookout for the tech startups. Those are also here in the Portland area. In fact, Rick Terosi, uh, if you're listening, go ahead and hit up Rick Terosi. I'm sure he'll get you guys going in the tech world. Brad, thank you again yeah, so uh, much. Gabriel, shout out to Rick. He's uh, he's a longtime friend and someone who's just awesome. So, oh, you they, know, Rick, that's what I'm talking. Small world. Yeah, Rick's great. Rick actually was on the show a couple of years. He was one of the first founders of coming coming on the show. Uh, so, real big appreciation to Rick and what he's been doing here in the state of Oregon. Awesome. Well, Brad, thank you again so much for folks listening. Again, please subscribe to the podcast at theshadesofe.com. You can also follow me on all that social channels, including TikTok, although I do not dance. I keep telling y'all folks, I will not dance on that damn thing. Please follow me at the Shades of E. Thank you and have a great night.